Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear friends and colleagues. It's always my pleasure to be with you. Uh, this week we are going to discuss a very important station, and actually it is a must come station in the exam. Uh, you will not find any exam without a special station about the laparoscopy. Uh, either it will be full station about the laparoscope and how to manage the complication, or it may come as a part of the preoperative gynae round station. It may come as a structured discussion or simulated patient task as a consent station, uh, or it may come as a part of another station as we said. It is also important in our daily clinical practice because each gynecologist should know what are the possible risks in laparoscopy, especially at the time of entry and how to reduce these possible risks. So this case, we are going to discuss it as a structured discussion station. In this station, you, uh, you will be evaluated regarding the information gathering, the communication with patients and colleagues, the patient safety and the applied clinical knowledge. So in this station, you are an ST5 in the gyne round, doing the round to arrange for the operative list for tomorrow. You have just seen a 30 years old patient. Her name is Emma Watson. Her body mass index is 35, and she is busted for laparoscopic left ovarian cystectomy. She was referred by her GP as she is suffering from chronic pelvic pain for two years and dyspareunia. She has history of previous cesarean sections, and the ultrasound is showing a complex left ovarian cyst 10 by 8 centimeters. Your consultant wants to discuss with you the possible surgical risks in this case and the surgical interventions to reduce these risks. So you will have 10 minutes in this station during which you are expected to obtain a relevant and targeted clinical data. Then you have to justify and formulate a management plan. You will discuss the possible risks related to this case and how to avoid these risks during the surgery and you will answer the examiner's question. What are the expected questions in this station? The first and the usual question in any structured discussion, he will ask you what are the other information you need to know about the patient. Then formulate your management plan and justify your management. Then the next question will be what are the possible risks in this case? and how to avoid the risks. The next, what is the best practice to reduce the laparoscopic complications? Another question is during the second report insertion, what are the vessels at risk of injury and how to reduce this risk? Also, if you have a vascular injury at the second report insertion, how to reduce and how to manage what are the principal management in case of inferior epigastric injury. The other question, if you are suspecting aortic injury, what is the steps of management? One common question, especially in the preoperative going around, he will ask you what you are going to do if you find, for example, endometriosis or unsuspected pathology or undiagnosed pathology before the surgery, like suspected cancer. So, these are the possible questions that may come in this station. Actually, the answers of these questions are collected from the green top guideline, from the TOG, and from the strat OG. So all the information you need to know about this station will be found here. So the answer for the first question, what are the other information you need to know about the case? Please, once you find this question, put in your mind, the presenting the complaint of the patient. Because most of us are, we are putting a plan for the history. But the most important part of the history is the presenting complaint. So please start the history by analyzing the complaint of the patient. So in this patient, her main complaint is pain. So you have to ask about the onset and the course and the duration of this pain, the site and the extent and the radiation, what increases the pain and what helps to relieve it. And this is a case of chronic pelvic pain, so you have to exclude other causes of chronic pelvic pain. So you have to ask about 
symptoms of endometriosis, symptoms of BID, uh, other causes of chronic pelvic pain like irritable bowel disease or sorry, inflammatory bowel disease. And you may even ask about the mental history because it may be a psychological cause of pain. The second complaint for this lady was dyspareunia. So you have to ask about the dyspareunia in specific if it was superficial or deep dyspareunia and if it's primary or it is secondary dyspareunia related to any other pathology. You have to ask about any associated bleeding or discharge, any changes in the appetite or weight loss, any previous investigations or treatment regarding these complaints and any bowel or bladder symptoms. These are the main questions you need to ask regarding your complaint. Then putting in mind the differential diagnosis of chronic pelvic pain, you have to, you have, you have to ask about the menstrual periods, endometriosis, if there is any pain with the menstruation, when is her last menstrual period, if she's using any contraceptions, if her smears are up to date, and if there is any history of sexually transmitted infections. Regarding the obstetric history, this patient has previous three cesarean section, so you have to ask about any complications of the previous cesareans. Her wishes for future fertility because this may affect your plan of management, and you will ask the permission from the patient to look at her operative notes. In the past history, please ask about any medical or surgical history, and don't forget the point of safety about the drug allergy. Information means the history and the examination and the investigation. So please, after the history, do not forget to ask about any examination finding if it's, if it's available and any previous investigations. You need a detailed scan to know more about the criteria of the cyst and you need to know about the result of tumor markers. This lady is 30 years old, so you will ask beside the CA125 about the LDH alpha fetoprotein and HCG. Very important point is to know about the preoperative counseling of the patient, what the patient is consented for, and if she was offered any alternative to the laparoscopic surgery, and the preoperative investigations, and the anesthetic review, and if the patient has DVT risk assessment. So this is a full answer regarding the first questions what are the other information you need to know about the case? The second question will be, discuss the possible surgical risk in this case. So if we will go back to the history, this lady has a high body mass index. Her body mass index was 35. So this puts the patient at risk during entry. It will be more difficult. And the post-operative, this patient is at a higher risk of having venous thromboembolism. The next point in the history, the patient has chronic pelvic pain and dyspareunia. So the most common cause of chronic pelvic pain and dyspareunia is endometriosis. Endometriosis puts the patient at risk of adhesions and a difficult surgery. Also bowel distension. The patient may have inflammatory bowel disease as a one of the differential diagnoses of chronic pelvic pain. So you have to put it in your mind and prepare your patient before surgery. The previous cesarean deliveries may put the patient at risk of adhesions and bowel and bladder injury. And also from the history, the cyst was complex. So this puts the patient at risk of having abnormal pathology of the cyst after removal. So these are the surgical risks in this case. The most important part is now you know the risks, how to reduce the risks of laparoscopy or what is the best practice to reduce the laparoscopic complications. Actually, in the majority of cases of laparoscopy, the laparoscope will go without any problems, but still there is incidence of serious complication. The incidence is one to two per thousand, and this number, you should remember it, because if you have a consent station, you should tell the patient about the possible risks including the serious and the frequent risk. So the serious risk, the incidence is one to two per thousand. The bowel damage, 0.4 per thousand, and the major vessel injury is 0.2 per thousand. So these are the major or the most serious 
complications of laparoscopy. The good point to uh, make yourself different from the other candidates during the exam is to be organized during your answer. So if he's asking you how to reduce the laparoscopic complications, please don't go directly for the operative interventions. The complications may be prevented by pre-operative measures, by intraoperative measures, and post-operative measures. So the best answer is to be organized and start to reduce the complication. This should be started pre-operative by pre-operative risk assessment of the patient. Not all patients are fit for laparoscopy and there are high risk and low risk patients. If this is elective laparoscopy, if the patient should be involved in the enhanced recovery program. Proper consent and proper counseling of the patient, offering the patient all other alternatives, including no treatment. In advanced cases, you may need bowel preparation and prophylactic antibiotics. In cases suspected to have bleeding, you should cross match and screen blood and blood products. Before the surgery started, you should do the WHO surgical safety checklist and the preoperative check, preoperative check for your instruments. The ergonomics, which means arrangement of the operative table and the monitors and the whole tower and the teamwork, which should be competent in doing laparoscopy. So these are the preoperative measures you can do to reduce the complications of laparoscopy. As we said, this station can come as a consent station. You will have a simulated patient that's coming for laparoscopy and you will be asked to take a consent from the patient. So you have to ask her about the procedure she's having. In lay language, it will be a keyhole procedure to search for a cause of your pain and dyspareunia. The intended benefit here is to search for the cause. You have, again, to explain all the serious risks to the patients and all the frequent risks. Any extra procedure needed to be done during the surgery, including blood transfusion or repair of any damage. The anesthetic review and then alternative treatment. And then the patient has to sign uh, after you signed that you offered her all the information she wants. So this is another form of the station. You have to take a consent before the surgery. And this is one of the steps to reduce the, pre, to reduce the risks pre-operative. Okay, so pre-operative measures we finished. Now the intraoperative measures. Actually, the most important risks, or the most serious risks of laparoscopy falls in the period between insertion of the virus needle and insertion of the laparoscope or the telescope or the camera. This period is called the blind time. Most of the complications occur at this time. So the best practice intraoperative to reduce the complications at entry. Number one, well-trained surgical staff. Involve the consultant if any suspicion of difficulty. Again, ergonomics, proper arrangement of the ergonomics and all the surgical instruments. Which entry technique you will use? The answer, the entry technique which you are more comfortable with it. Here we will find some conflict between the RCOG and the Royal College of Surgeons. The RCOG, the recommendation are mainly using the closed technique but the Royal College of Surgeons are recommending using the open technique, open Hassoun technique for all cases of laparoscopy. But the answer to this question, the technique that you are more comfortable with. During entry, the patient should be supine in flat position because don't put the patient in Trindlinberg position because this approximates the distance between the great vessels and the skin. So during entry, the patient should be flat. Before entry, you have to palpate the abdomen to check if there is any masses or the position of the aorta. You may feel it, especially in very thin patient. 
if the patient had previous scars, avoid these scars during choosing the point of entry. And when making the incision, the incision has to be vertical incision and it should be wide enough to avoid putting too much pressure during entry. And this much pressure may lead to the trocar going too deep and you will injure the bowel or the vessels. So this is before starting the incision, you have to put these points in your mind. Call for help or and trained surgical staff, ergonomics, the point of entry, avoid any scars, use the entry technique, you are comfortable with it and the patient should be in flat or in supine position. The virus needle is a very important part of the station. It may come by its own as a station, teaching station where the uh, trainee will come and ask you, I need to know about the neomoprotinium and the virus needle. So it's very important to know about the virus needle. The safety criteria of the virus needle, it should be sharp with good and tested spring action. Spring action means that it is freely going up and down. The virus needle should be inserted at right angle to the skin to penetrate the fascia and the proteinium. It will be put at the base of the umbilicus, perpendicular to the skin at right angle. This will make the virus needle penetrate the thinnest part of the abdominal wall. And you will hear two clicks, one click from the fascia and the other click from the proteinium. This is one of the several tests that can be used to check that the tip of the needle is in the proteinial cavity. But there are other tests you may be asked what are the other tests that you have to do to check if the needle is free in the proteinal cavity? Number one, the double click test. Number two, the hanging drop test, where you will put a drop of saline over the tip of the virus needle. Then you elevate the abdomen up by the negative pressure inside, the drop will go inside the proteinal cavity. Another test is called the Balmer test or aspiration test, where you will use a syringe full with 10 to 20 ml of saline, and then you will push it inside the virus needle and then aspirate again. If the fluid did not come, means it's freely floating now inside the proteinal cavity and you are in, but if it will come back, means that you are in a closed space and most probably you did not penetrate the peritoneum. The most valuable test is that the initial insufficient pressure will be single digit number or less than eight millimeter mercury. Please avoid the test of moving the virus needle laterally because if you are inside a bowel or a blood vessel, you may convert a small injury into a large one. So these are the possible tests that can use to check that the tip of the needle inside the proteinium. The pressure during entry should be 20 to 25 millimeter mercury before inserting the primary trocar. Why 20 to 25? Because this will increase the distance between the umbilicus or the site of entry and the great vessels at the back to about six centimeters. If it is less than that, the distance will be low and there is high possibility of injury of the great vessels. Once you are in and all the trockers are inside, you can drop the pressure to 12 to 15 millimeter mercury, and this will be the working pressure during the surgery to avoid respiratory compromise. Another safety point, if you try twice to insert the virus needle and you failed, you have to stop, ask for help from your consultant and convert to another point of entry, which may be a palmar point, or you may go into open Hassan technique. So all the questions about the virus needle will be from this slide. Now, the pneumoprotinium is complete. The pressure now is 20 to 25. It's time to insert the primary trocar. So what are the safety points during the primary trocar insertion or how to reduce the risks during the insertion of the primary trocar? Again, the primary trocar should be inserted at 90 degrees to the skin in the base of the umbilicus. 
and you should stop immediately once you feel that you are intraperitoneal. If you want to advance the trocar or the virus needle from the beginning, you can advance it toward the pelvis at an angle of 45 degrees toward the pelvis. This will protect the intra-abdominal organs, especially the bowel from injury. But initially, you should insert the virus needle and the trocar at 90 degree or perpendicular to the skin. Once the laparoscope is introduced, another point of safety, you have to rotate the camera 360 degrees to check if there is any possibility of adherent bowels. The rate of adhesions, as we all know, it is 50% if you have a midline laparotomy before and almost 25% if the patient had a previous cesarean or low transverse incision. So if you have any concern that the bowel may be adherent to the base of the umbilicus, what you will do at this point, keep the primary trocar in its place, insert a secondary board, which is, will be five millimeter board, and you will use a five millimeter camera. From this five millimeter camera, you can see or have a look at the site of the primary trocar insertion if there is any surround, if it is surrounded by any bowels or there is any possibility of injury or bleeding. Once you finish the procedure, points of safety, you should remove the trocars under vision. Under vision, if you remove it under vision, you can check if there is a through and through injury of the bowel adherent under the umbilicus. Also another point of safety regarding the trocar sites, if you have a midline trocar and the trocar site is more than 10 millimeter, you have to close the uh, trocar site to avoid board site hernia. So these are the safety points and how to reduce the risks related to the primary trocar during insertion and during removal. If you find difficulty in the entry, and as we said, this is the most common types of injury, you can choose alternative entry techniques. The alternative entry techniques will be alternative sites and alternative techniques. The alternative technique like open Hasson technique, where you will open the skin at the base of the umbilicus layer by layer. It may be difficult, especially in obese patients, so you can choose another alternative entry sites like the palmar point. You should know that the palmar point is three centimeter below the left costal margin in the midclavicular line. The contraindication for the palmar point entry is if the patient has splenomegaly or if the patient has previous surgery in this area. There are other alternative sites, but they are not recommended. Other alternative devices like the optical virus needle or the VZ board, but they are not commonly used. So the alternative entry technique, either you will go for the open Hasson technique or the Balmer point entry. All these are falling under how to reduce the risk during the operation, intraoperative. Okay, now we finish the how to reduce the risk with the virus needle, how to reduce the risk of primary board insertion, now it's time for secondary board. The secondary board, the primary safety point is to insert the safety board under direct vision. Now the telescope is inside, so you can see intraperitoneal, so insert it under direct vision. Again, all the trokers, all the needles should be inserted perpendicular to the skin to reduce the distance that you are penetrating the skin. Again, the pressure should be 20 to 25 millimeter mercury. The most common vessel to be injured during injury is the inferior epigastric. So it should be visualized during entry by the laparoscope. Once the tip of the trocar has penetrated the peritoneum, it should be angled again towards the pelvis to avoid any injury of the great vessels in the lateral wall or injury of the bowel. During removal, again, as a primary board, it should be removed under direct vision to ensure that there is no hemorrhage. If observed, it should be treated if present. Regarding the uh, closure of the board site, 
If it is lateral and it's more than seven millimeter at this point, you should close the board site to avoid board site hernia. So to avoid board site hernia, if it is lateral and more than seven millimeter, you have to close it. If it is midline and more than 10 millimeter, you have to close it to avoid the board site hernia. Another question that you may be asked during the exam. During secondary board insertion, what are the vessels at risk of injury and how to reduce this risk? A common mistake that the answer will be, yes, the most common uh, vessel to be injured is the inferior epigastric. No, yes, the inferior epigastric is the most common, but there are other vessels that can be injured during the entry. So to be more organized, and to impress the examiner, you will say that we have superficial vessels and deep vessels. The superficial vessels, which are the superficial circumflex iliac and the superficial epigastric arteries. Both of them originate from the femoral artery. One will go above the inguinal ligament and the other below the inguinal ligament and distribute towards the anterior superior iliac spine and to the umbilicus. These are the superficial vessels that can be injured during entry. The deep vessel is the inferior epigastric artery and vein. So the inferior epigastric artery is a branch from the external iliac. That's why if it is injured and there is bleeding, this may be a life-threatening condition and it should be managed immediately. The common mistake is how to avoid injury by trans elimination. Actually, you cannot see the inferior epigastric artery by trans elimination. Trans elimination is used only to avoid injury of the superficial vessels, which are the superficial circumflex iliac and the superficial epigastric. But for the deep vessel, the deep vessel here, if we can see the inferior epigastric, there are anatomical landmarks for the inferior epigastric. You can see here, this is the obliterated umbilical artery the obliterated umbilical artery or the medial umbilical ligament. So obliterated umbilical artery or the medial umbilical ligament. This is the one. Okay. The other side here, you will find the round ligament. In the angle between the round ligament and the obliterated umbilical artery or the medial umbilical ligament, this will be the point where the inferior epigastric appears. So you should be lateral to this point. Again, the anatomical landmark is the angle between the obliterated umbilical artery and the round ligament. From the angle between these two ligaments, the inferior epigastric will start entering into the anterior abdominal wall. So during entry, you have to go lateral to this point. Again, how to reduce the vascular injury at the secondary board insertion, the basic principle is to go under vision and to remove the trocar again under vision. So insertion and removal under vision. The superficial vessels, how to avoid the superficial vessels by trans elimination. But the deep vessels, you have to go for the anatomical landmark. Again, this is the medial umbilical ligament or the obliterated umbilical artery. This is the round ligament here. And in the angle between the obliterated umbilical artery and the round ligament, you will find the inferior epigastric coming down from the external iliac into the anterior abdominal wall. So your board site should be lateral to this point. Like this, you will avoid going through the inferior epigastric and avoid bleeding from this very vital vessel. The mistake happened and Another question, while you are assisting in a laparoscopy, there is bleeding from the inferior epigastric artery. So what are the principles of management? This is another exam question you may face during the exam that now you are in a situation where there is injury of the inferior epigastric, what are the principles of management and what you will do? This is an emergency. So in any emergency, please the first step is to call for help call for help from the consultant. You may need vascular surgeon. You may need to call for the blood bank for blood and the blood products. The best way of management of injured or lacerated vessel 
is suturing or ligation of the inferior epigastric. And this can be done laparoscopically through intracorporeal stitching or through passing a stitch by the endoclose, or you may even do it by wound extension at the board side and securing the bleeding vessels by suturing or ligation. Another way of controlling the bleeding is to insert a Foley's catheter through the board side and then inflate the balloon, pull the balloon and put it under tension and keep it for six to 24 hours. This will result in a tamponade effect and it will control the bleeding. Sometimes you may need the, uh, or you may use electrosurgery to coagulate the bleeding vessel. It is sometimes successful, but it carries the risk if there is any retraction of the inferior epigastric, it may lead to post-operative hematoma. Another point, if you have the facility to do percutaneous angiography, then embolization of the bleeding vessel if it is available. If you discover that the hematoma uh, occurs post-operative or you discovered it post-operative, the initial management will be conservative management. Just do local compression over the site of the hematoma and observe the patient. But if the hematoma is enlarging or the patient becomes hemodynamically unstable, in this case, it will need exploration and ligation of the bleeding vessel. So the principles of management, if you have an injury of the inferior epigastric, number one, call for help. Number two, suturing. Number three, the use of Foley's catheter. You may use coagulation, but it has some risks. If available, you may use percutaneous angiography and embolization. If it is post-operative, you can use a local compression or conservative management unless the hematoma is enlarging or the patient becomes hemodynamically unstable. At this point, exploration is indicated. Some safety points regarding the weight of the patient or the body mass index. Our patient here body mass index is 35. So in general, in very obese or very thin patients, the open has shown or entry through the palmar points are recommended at uh, are recommended for the primary entry in this woman. Some additional recommendation in obese women, if you are using the virus needle, again, put the virus needle perpendicular to the skin at the base of the umbilicus and the needle should be inserted vertically. At, so at this point, you will have the thinnest part of the anterior abdominal wall, so you can use the ordinary needle. Sometimes you may consider using a larger size needle, especially in patients who are going for bariatric surgery. Regarding the very thin woman, the risk here will be more regarding the great vessels because the aorta in very thin women lies almost 2.5 centimeter below the skin. So in very thin women, great care must be taken during performing the first entry. Again, open Hassoun or Balmer point entry is preferable in this situation. And this is a very common question during discussion of the preoperative gynae round. You will find one of the risk factors uh, is either high or low BMI. So in this case, in general, use the open Hassoun or the Balmer point entry is recommended. Another question, this part is from the dog, that after insertion of the trocar, you observe that there is sudden drop of the blood pressure of the patient and you suspected aortic injury. What are the steps of management in this case? So once you inserted the primary trocar, the blood pressure dropped and the patient becomes unstable. So what you will do? Don't go with the camera and look if there is, okay, now you are suspecting injury. So you have to go for the initial management and then, then the definitive treatment. In any emergency situation, please, any bleeding, either in gynae procedure or even during antibartum or postpartum hemorrhage, remember the four steps in management of this case. Communication, resuscitation, investigations and the monitoring, then treatment. So the initial measures in this case will be communication, Call for help, call for help from the consultant, 
the vascular and the general surgeon, blood bank for blood products, porters, the junior colleagues, and the hematologist also. Team working is very important here in emergency situation. So you should use a team approach and the task delegations to all the team members. You will ask the anesthetist to start the antibiotics and ask for blood and blood products. And you will tell him that the procedure will be prolonged. Ask for additional equipment that may be needed by the surgeons. Insert two white bore cannulas, start fluid resuscitation, full scaster to be inserted if it's not already there and start counting the input and the output. And take blood for investigation. The usual investigation as any emergency situation will be full blood count, urea and electrolytes, renal and liver function test, and x matched blood. This, these are the initial measures for management in any emergency situation, communication, resuscitation, investigations, and the monitoring. Now the definitive treatment. It's very important, please, don't remove the trocar that injured the blood vessel. Just to keep it in place. It has a tamponade effect. It maintains a compression over the bleeding vessel, and it will identify the point of injury when you do laparotomy. Otherwise, you will start searching about it once you open the abdomen. So leave the trocar in place, immediate laparotomy. Once you did laparotomy, do aortic compression to stop bleeding or apply vascular clamps. Then the repair will be done by the vascular surgeon. It's either simple repair or we can use sealants or vascular grafts or batches. Please don't forget after controlling the patient to complete the primary surgery if the patient is now stable, because most uh, of us will forget to mention this point. Uh, uh, as long as the patient is stable, we can complete the primary procedure that the patient was posted for. Then very important point of safety, sharps and swabs should be counted to avoid any missing towels or instruments. So now these are all the answers or the points in the answer of how to reduce the risks during com or risks or complication during laparoscopy. So please remember that there are pre-operative measures, intra-operative measures, now the post-operative measure. If you have any complication during laparoscopy, please, this patient has to be in the, observed in the ICU or level two or three bit according to the level of organ damage. Muse the chart and the special consideration regarding the fluid management, the antibiotics, if there are any drains or catheters, how to deal with it. VTE risk assessment and thromboprophylaxis, especially with prolonged surgery and massive bleeding. And please don't forget the clinical governance issues because with the stress of the exam, you may forget these issues. Remember the six Ds. The first D is documentation, accurate documentation of the events of the surgery and what happened, detex or incident reporting, debriefing the patient, the family members, and the team, duty of candor, explaining the chains of events that happened during the surgery, be honest during explaining the events to the patient, discussion, which include audits, root cause analysis and reflective practice to avoid these complications occurring in the future. And then the last D is for drills. You have to arrange for simulation training for all the surgical staff regarding the complication and how to avoid this complication. So again, how to answer the question of how to reduce the risks of laparoscopic surgery, you have to mention, you have to be more organized we have to mention the pre-operative measures, the intra-operative measure during entry, and the post-operative care according to the type of injury, what happened. The last question in this station will be, what are you going to do if you find, for example, unsuspected uh, pathology like endometriosis or you suspect malignancy? The best answer here is to say it depends. Always in a structured discussion, make your answer starting with it depends. 
because there is no sharp answer in this question. So here the answer will be, it depends on the consent that was taken from the patient before the surgery and the patient preferences regarding treatment or no treatment during the diagnostic laparoscopy and the severity of the condition you find during the laparoscope. So it depends on the consent and the patient preferences and it depends on the severity of condition. So common question, what you will find, what you will do if you find a stage one or two endometriosis. So if the patient was consented before the surgery and she, too, she prefers the treatment at the same setting, we can do treatment of stage one or two endometriosis either by adhesolysis, fulgration, cauterization, and taking biopsy for histopathology. But if you find stage three or four endometriosis or you suspected malignancy, this will be another major surgery. The maximum you can do in this stage, you can take biopsy and arrange for other, another setting or another surgery after multidisciplinary team meeting. So this is how to answer the questions in this station. Actually, uh, I know that the informations are too much, but you will not find all the questions in the same station, but these are all the possible questions that you may find in a case of laparoscopy during the exam. Thank you so much. I hope it was useful. If you find it useful, please don't forget to pray for me and to share it with your friends. Thank you all and have a good luck.